In the mid-central part of the United States, it's off stage at the Longhorn Music Room. Eddie Harris and his group are performing here, and Eddie, sitting out in front for the first time as a member of your audience, I have a feeling there's a phrase that really describes you, and that's the medium combined with a message. I don't know how you react to that. <laughs> I don't a message. I'm always talking about one thing or another because I'm going into a new field of stand-up talking, but the message, as far as the music is concerned, is pertaining to really trying to get across to musicians throughout the world that you can be versatile. You don't have to be into one realm of music where you wind up stagnating yourself because so many writers and I say people, disc jockeys and everyone, they try to get musicians to be categorized and musicians try to live under their own what is I call penmanship or journalism. If a guy is labeled as an avant-garde player or a mainstream third string, he tries to live up to it. And when every musician starts out to play, he starts out as a musician. He don't start out as any one class of musician, uh, not even a classical musician, because he starts out as a musician, just learn to play his instrument. Now, he might like different realms of music and others, but through his career, he's going to have to play all types of music in order to survive. Well, how about those musical influences specifically in, in the program that I sat in with last night? I heard everything from backstreet uh, Mississippi small towns to the bayou country to uh, the flavors of big band jazz and ensembles to gospel choirs, and there you were. Things have been very difficult for me in that respect because I'm more the exception than the rule. And with my strong type of personality and will, I don't let people dictate to me. Uh, what I'm trying to explain is primarily I'm considered a jazz musician, jazz saxophonist as such, quote unquote. Therefore, being the exception more than the rule, you don't find uh, the general jazz musician, or I should say the upper crust jazz musician, a guy who can play his instrument and been known to play his instrument across the world, singing, singing the blues or playing a, a stomp down funky tune where people would dance off of it. And if I can do it, why not do it? I think if other guys could do it, I think they should do it. With respect to your music, there are also messages, Eddie Harris, and I heard some messages last night, a variety of things that speak about people. And uh, that seems to come from your compositions and the compositions of your colleagues, too, with whom you work. Well, it's, well when I'm singing a number, as uh, the bass player wrote a couple of tunes for me, the one that I'm singing is uh, why Must We Part, which sounded like a Smokey Robinson um, type number, Temptation, which I'm singing in falsetto. But then other tunes that I've written, what you're speaking of is like, I need some money. You know, that that's the message of the country. Like, <laughs> I tell a joke on stage sometime, New York needs some money. Everybody needs some money. And it relates to people. And another one is Bad Luck Is All I Have. That's very typified the average black Chicano Puerto Rican in this country because they encountered all of those things that happened to them. You know, they're riding the bus. The bus goes so slow, you forget where you're going. People uh, hide uh, the wife going to leave you at the kids and, uh, and you got the girlfriend that's going to quit you and you laid off your job. I mean, people can understand that that's really happening. And I'm trying a new approach into blues, whereas I have atomic lines of rhyming, but I say a different line every time, and where it's a constant message, you are hearing what I'm saying. Where I don't repeat the line, as the general blues that says, my wife came over to see me the other day. My wife came over to see me the other day. 
and she came up to me and said, now what do you have to say? You know, something of that nature. Whereas I continue it straight through. My wife came over to see me the other day, said, now, man, what have you got to say? If it's nothing else, I'm going to be on my way. <laughs> you know, it's like that. And that's a complete thought of a paragraph, and that's what's happening. And it's a new way of singing blues. Make people listen all while you're singing. <laughs> And what, uh, what strikes me, too, is that uh, you're not dealing with escapism and dreams and fantasies. You're talking about reality. Oh, yes. I do that even when I'm talking on stage <laughs> to people. And it kind of shocks them because it's funny what I'm saying, and I don't try to use the profanity to try to get across, uh, you know, the shock as a shock treatment on people. It's just every day I talk about guys trying to get across with young ladies, and that's what they're in there. They're in there looking at the young ladies trying to get across, and they won't even buy them a drink. They hit on them, but they just sit there and look and talk about them all evening. And if there's no young ladies hardly in there, they don't want to come in because it says nothing happening. But when there's something happening is when there's a lot of young ladies. But when the ladies get up and leave, they're ready to go again. Says so nothing happening. They didn't hit on them when they was there. So nothing is never happening for them. No matter how you view your uh, communication, there's always a message, and it always concerns reality, Eddie Harris. <laughs> That's right. That's correct. <laughs> Eddie Harris, off stage at the Longhorn Music Room in Minneapolis with St. Paul just across the river. Well, my thanks to you, Eddie, for a look at um, some of the influences and the messages that you put together in a formidable program of entertainment. <laughs> formidable. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> The Evolution of a Musician, Eddie Harris, composer, performer, and I'm sure an inventor, innovator in every sense of the word. Eddie Harris, a um, long time ago, back in the 50s when you were serving with the United States Army in Europe, you were involved in a totally different musical bag, so to speak. What was life like then? It wasn't miserable. I, I would think off the top of anyone's mind, they said, oh, miserable in the service. Well, in the service can be miserable, but I was playing with the symphony orchestra, 7th Army Symphony Orchestra in Weingen, right outside of Stuttgart, Germany. Consequently, playing in this vernacular, you didn't get an opportunity to really know Army life because it was a four-star general that had thought up the symphony orchestra as a, a relation, you know, some kind of PR, public relations with the Germans and the Americans after World War II. And in turn, he went to the Pentagon for it. So therefore, this was his pet peeve, <laughs> you know, just to keep these cats all happy over there because he thought it up and all we did was act like little spoiled children. <laughs> we didn't get up for breakfast a lot of time, didn't fall out when it was time to go uh, an alert <laughs> this is what we, we did and uh, the symphony orchestra guys out of the symphony orchestra we formed what was called a jazz unit and there was uh, a lot of very popular names of today now as Quincy Jones said and he was over there writing he said wow he wish he had this band out of you know out of the service you had the people like, uh, for an example, you had my roommate was Don Ellis. And I had uh, Cedar Walton on the piano. You had uh, um, Lanny Morgan who plays first alto in the big bands out on the coast. And you had a Blaine Hales who plays the first trumpet. And Dave Sanchez, a very outstanding trombonist. You had people like the, the Calvin Newborns playing the guitar. You had a uh, Don Menza, the tenor saxophonist. He had uh, Leo Wright, was the alto lead in the band. And you had uh, you know, Wayne Shorter. Plays. <laughs> I mean, just an outstanding big band. Sounds like a magnificent musical environment for you to work out in and begin to generate new ideas and new directions. Did that happen to you? Well, yes and no. 
uh, prior to the service, I, I'm from Chicago Southside with a, a gentleman in the area by the name of uh, Sun Ra. And his original band, we were all in the same grade in high school. Therefore, we played kind of abstract and played a lot of funny music then. Plus, I studied from a teacher that taught downtown Chicago, who also taught a guy named Johnny Griffin and uh, Lee Konix. And I played with a lot of strange people, as to say, you know, playing, playing what we call abstract music and that was written. You know, not just by ear, that was written abstract. Consequently, when I went into the service, I was full of that type of environment, more so than playing in the orchestras. I'd played the Sherwood orchestras and some orchestras around town, but I didn't really like that. I liked playing really jazz in the abstract form. So the environment in the service was just another avenue of what I was already into, but it kind of a little sidetracked me in a more of a disciplinary way of doing things. But I've always been an experimentalist, and therefore that's what had it gave me such a rough time when I was out out there because no matter what I be into, I get tired of it in a minute, and I'll go to something else. You know, I play without the neck on the horn. I I sawed keys in half. I've bent bells on the horn. I've had one horn that I've had all along that I wouldn't do that to. I'd get a pawn shop horn and experiment with it. And I'm still doing that. That's basically what I'm about right now. In other words, you're involved in the development of new music technology, which includes putting, a, I suppose, a, a saxophone mouthpiece on a trumpet. And, but more than that, you're, you're experimenting with the dynamics and sound and you're also utilizing musical synthesis in a, in a sense, aren't you? Yes. Well, see, you know, like uh, that, what you say, the saxophone mouthpiece on the trumpet, yes, I have that, a patent number on that in Washington. That is my first patent that I've done on my own, handling on my own, selling all over the world on my own, with my own company that I'm having it manufactured in Elkhart, and I have an office in Tulsa, another in Chicago. I live in L.A., and I'm set up one there. I have six books out that I'm doing these things on my own now. Prior to that, I've been with, uh, used to be Chicago Musical Instrument Company there in New Orleans now. I've been affiliated with all other guys because I really didn't have the money and I just come up with ideas relating to what they had. And they pay me a portion of money and it was like uh, what you would call, uh, you know, something that, you know, like a guy have a, like Schaefer did with the saxophone. The saxophone's out there, so he put some side key manual, you know, where you can operate the side keys faster. So I, I what you call an improvement on something. You did? And so it's an invention, but it's not a total invention. That's where guys don't realize it because I couldn't get my name on it because it's already out there and I had just improved on it. But on these type of things, I've done as many as about eight of them in which I've gotten compensated for, like to pick up in the mouthpiece on the electric saxophone, the foot switch. So people don't know I'm doing all these type of things. But now, thankfully, behind my success of my record sales, I'm getting enough money to take the excess, meaning the money that would go to the government, I take that and invest it in on my own company, which is tax. You can write that off, and I put it on my company, and now I'm making my inventions work for me. Well, that's certainly an interesting story, the uh, exploration and technology that you are developing against your musical skill, Eddie, and in view of all this, we see jazz as New Orleans style, and we see it in the mainstream category, small combinations and big bands, and then the contemporary viewpoint, which could be uh, Les McCann, Roland Kirk, uh, it could be uh, Sun Ra, and it is Eddie Harris. But there's a new music coming uh, over the horizon, 
and it's coming fast because of amplification and uh, the use of the computer and is it what's it gonna be uh, how would you describe the future of, of modern American music well I don't see myself as a part of it I mean, uh, contrary to what you might think because I am the pace setter of it started I've been playing electric saxophone since 66 I come out with it but people never tend to know who starred something because an avant-garde music is Ornette Coleman and everyone says Coltrane or Eric Dolphy like that before Ornette they wasn't even playing that way you know and okay Eddie Harris plays electric but you know you can't you know that by a lot of people it says oh Herbie Hancock weather report Miles Davis I was playing electric and those guys was laughing at me but see you get on the bandwagon you never make anything when you are doing it but I'm trying to counteract that by doing various things like the point of going to singing where I get over the hump of relating to people where I can sell the records, get the money, and I can make my experiments. All right. Is that the payoff for you? Oh, yes. To get the money, then I can make my experiments because I have a lot of ideas, and a lot of people have a lot of ideas in pool rooms and barbershops and maybe beauty parlors if they're ladies. Uh, but an idea to me is in a strange place when a person don't know what to do with it. I mean, to me, an idea is something you go through. I have ideas and I have blueprinted them and sit down and all I need is the capital, you know, to carry out these ideas. And a lot of wealthy people and big business people have talked with me because they realize that I'm a commodity and I'm subject to come up with something at any time. Even astrologers have done my charts and say, I'm going to invent something someday to help mankind. And this is before... They even knew I was Eddie Harris or, you know, it's like that. Just people just see me trying all types of things. And they've had people just charge me that didn't know who I was even now. And they said the same thing. And I'm not trying to just live up to their chart. I'm just a curious guy putting things together. But I cannot go with these big business people or people that want to back me because they want to control me. And then I'd wind up just working a day job for them. Eddie Harris... A pleasure to sit in with you and hear about your, your art form, your engineering technology, and your innovative exploration uh, of music and its technology, and also, as a member of the audience, music and the message that you deliver. Thank you very much.